In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to make highly customizable parametric spiral shells in Blender, like this fine specimen here, or any of these. In the interest of time, let's jump right into it. Before you open Blender, though, let's lay out some of the terms and ideas here so we have a common, unambiguous language. We're going to be building a shell that rises upward along the z-axis, winding itself around the axis. A single loop around the axis sweeping through exactly 360 degrees, let's call that a coil. So a single shell in this tutorial consists of a whole number of coils. Every coil is going to be made up of a whole number of small pieces called wedges. All wedges sweep out the same number of degrees within the coil, so if you choose to make your coils contain only one wedge, the wedge would sweep out 360 degrees. At two wedges per coil, a wedge spans 180 degrees, four wedges per coil would be 90 degrees, and so on. For reasons that will become clear later, we're going to go one level deeper than that. Every wedge is going to be made up of a whole number of even smaller pieces called sub-wedges. The principle here is the same as before. If each of your wedges took up 90 degrees, for example, and you decided to go with 10 sub-wedges per wedge, each sub-wedge would constitute 9 degrees of the spiral. Okay, so a shell is made of coils, a coil is made of wedges, and a wedge is made of sub-wedges. You can think of the shell as a long winding tube that tapers or scales down as it winds around. The change in size between the start of one coil and the start of the next, let's call that value the scale. So if the tube shrinks to half of its size after one coil, the scale would be 0.5. If it was three quarters of its original size, the scale would be 0.75, and so on. In addition to scaling down by a constant factor with every coil, the tube also moves upward along the z-axis. Unlike the scale value, this distance value is not constant, so let's call the distance along the z-axis between the start of the first coil and the start of the second coil, the lift. Finally, if scale and lift tell us about the changes that take place between two consecutive coils, we can define corresponding values for the changes that take place between two consecutive wedges and between two consecutive sub-wedges. We're going to call these values wedge scale, wedge lift, sub-wedge scale, and sub-wedge lift. That's enough laying of the groundwork. Let's open Blender and delete the default cube, because shells aren't cubes, they're circles obviously. Kill the default light as well, we don't need it. Create a circle mesh, rotate it 90 degrees on the y-axis, and jump into an orthographic view to look straight at it. Tab into edit mode, duplicate the circle, scale it down just a little bit. These will become the inner and outer surfaces of the shell. Drag all vertices to the right of the origin and tab back out of edit mode. Go to object properties and scroll to the bottom where it reads custom properties and expand it. This is where we're going to create the numerical controls that govern the shape of the shell. Click the Add button and you'll get a new property called Prop. Click the Edit button and rename it to Coils, with a minimum value of 1 and a maximum value of 100. Click OK when done. This is going to be your way of controlling the number of coils in your shell. We need 8 more custom properties, so pause the tutorial now and create them as shown on the screen here. You'll notice 4 of those properties are named with underscores. This serves two purposes, to keep them grouped together, but also it's a common convention for naming things that you're not meant to control directly. More on that soon. Now create three empties and name them Coil Control, Wedge Control, and Sub-Wedge Control. Let's also rename our circle to Shell. Now make Shell the parent of all three empties. We forgot to apply the rotation we gave to our circle earlier, so select just the Shell and choose Object Apply Rotation. Now go to Modifiers and add an Array Modifier. Use Object Offset by disabling Relative Offset and enabling Object Offset. Choose Sub-Wedge Control as the controlling object. Make sure the count value for the modifier is set to 2. Now add a second array modifier. Give it an object offset as well, associated with the sub-wedge control empty. We'd like the count value here to be the number of sub-wedges in a single wedge. Let's do that with a simple driver. Go to those custom properties we created and right-click on the sub-wedges property value and choose Copy as New Driver. Then go back to our array modifier, right-click on the count property value and choose Paste Driver. You'll see it turns purple to indicate it's being automatically controlled by a driver now. It shows the value of our sub-wedges property, and from now on it will automatically update when we change that custom property. Very handy. Make a third array modifier with an object offset associated with the wedge control empty. Use the same simple copy-paste driver technique to control the count value in this array modifier with the custom property called wedges. Now make a fourth and final array modifier with an object offset pointed at the coil control empty. Use our handy driver copy pasting to control its count value with the custom property we named coils. Let's do a few more copy paste drivers before we get to the more interesting ones. Copy our lift custom property as a new driver and use it to control the Z location coordinate of our coil control empty. Then copy our scale custom property as a new driver and use it to control the X, Y, and Z components of the coil control empty's scale. Let's use a driver to control the rotation of our wedges. Select the wedge control empty, right click on its Z rotation value, and click add driver. This will open a little pop-up dialog, but I'd rather work in the proper editor, so click the show in drivers editor button to open the drivers editor window. On the left, select the Z rotation value, and let's make the panel on the right bigger, so we're not so cramped. Set the driver type to scripted expression. 
You'll see there's already an input variable by default called var. It's not what we want, so let's change it. First, change its name to wedges. Click on the icon to the left of the name and change its type to single property. Click the object selector to choose our shell object, and under path, enter square bracket, double quote, wedges, double quote, square bracket, exactly as shown here. You should see the value update automatically to show the number that we set for that custom property earlier. Now change the expression for this driver to pi times 2 divided by wedges. Go back to the main window and you'll see this driver is already having some effect. Let's control our sub wedge rotation next. Select the sub wedge control empty and add a new driver to its Z rotation value like we did a moment ago and open it in the drivers editor. Don't forget to make it a scripted expression. Change the default input variable called var to one called wedges following exactly the same steps we did a moment ago. We need a second input variable, so click the Add Input Variable button, make sure its type is Single Property, and name it Sub Wedges. Point it at our custom property of the same name, just like we did with the wedges value, but this time the path will of course be square bracket double quote sub wedges double quote square bracket. Set this driver's expression to pi times 2 divided by wedges times sub wedges, just like shown here. Go back to our custom properties and add a new driver to control the underscore wedge scale property. Same as before, use the driver's editor, make a descriptive expression, make sure that any input variables we use are of type single property. We're always going to do it that way, so I'll stop mentioning it. Create input variables called scale and wedges, pointing at the custom properties of the same name. Set the expression to pow scale 1 over wedges as shown. Now pause the tutorial and create the following drivers for the remaining three underscore prefixed custom properties, with input variables pointing at shell object custom properties. As far as drivers go, all we have left to get everything wired up is a handful of simple copy-paste drivers again. Copy the underscore subwedge lift custom property as a new driver and paste it into the Z location coordinate of the subwedge control empty. Copy the underscore subwedge scale custom property as a new driver and paste it into the X, Y, and Z scale values of the subwedge control empty. Do the same with the underscore wedge lift and underscore wedge scale custom properties to control the corresponding values of the wedge controls transform. Now is the perfect time to save an extra copy of your blend file somewhere, so you can avoid doing all that work again the next time you feel like making a spiral shell. Everything we do from here on is about playing with the parameters of your shell to find a shape you like, and making the final result permanent. It's worth pointing out that, as with most things in Blender, this is not the only way to construct a spiral shell. But what this method has going for it is the kind of control and customization you now have at your fingertips. Let's look at some of the ways that you can control this intricate structure you've just crafted. Starting with the coils property, this one is obvious. It lets you control how many coils your shell is made of. The lift property gives you a fine degree of control over how far apart the coil loops are from each other. The scale property lets you adjust the severity of the tapering of your shell. Wedges and subwedges let you control the amount of rotational symmetry you're going to end up with, and how much geometry you'll have available within a wedge to play around and create your own custom surface features. Real-world shells like this don't typically have perfectly round cross-sections. So you may want to go into edit mode and distort your two circles to look a little different. Remember to keep everything to one side of the origin. Maybe something like this. Once you've got a cross section and overall shape with which you're satisfied, let's start locking it in. Get out of edit mode, go to your modifiers and click the apply button on your first modifier. Tab back into edit mode and notice that you're not editing a simple cross section anymore. You're editing a single sub wedge. Well, actually, you're editing all the subwedges at the same time, so it's important not to move any of the vertices around, because we need them to remain perfectly aligned with their neighbors being generated by the remaining modifiers. Switch to Edge Select mode and select the two edge loops on the inner side of the subwedge. Then search for Bridge Edge Loops and click it. Now do the same with the two outer edge loops. Now we've made the inner and outer surfaces of the shell. Now would be a good time to apply different materials to the inside faces and the outside faces, because doing it later will be a lot more challenging. Don't worry about what those materials look like, you can customize them when this is all done. Now let's join these two surfaces together to make a closed mesh. Go to your modifiers and turn them off in the viewport, just for now, because it will make this easier. In viewport overlays, enable face orientation so we can make sure our normals point the way they should. The outer surface and the inner surface of the shell should appear blue. Red bad, blue good. If you need to flip face orientations, highlight them, search for flip normals and click it. You can use bridge edge loops again to seal off the gaps between the inner and outer surfaces. You can turn face orientation off again as well. Now tab out of edit mode and re-enable your modifiers in the viewport. Now that the subwedges are done, let's make a whole wedge. Go to your topmost modifier, enable merge so that we won't have duplicate vertices, and click apply. Tab back into edit mode and you'll see that you're editing an entire wedge now. 
This is where you can create custom surface decorations that will be repeated symmetrically around the shell. First, let's do a little cleanup. Go to the wireframe view and face select mode. Deselect any selected faces and go to select, select all by trait, and interior faces. These are a bunch of faces that we don't need, so press X and delete them. Now we can go back to solid view and start adding custom surface decorations. Do anything you like here, but be careful not to move any vertex that is a contact point between neighboring wedges. Just like before, we need those vertices to remain perfectly aligned. All the other vertices are fair game. Don't worry about surface features being too pointy or flat. We'll fix that later with smooth shading and a subdivision surface modifier. Tab back out of edit mode and go to your topmost modifier. Enable merge on it and click apply. There's only one modifier left. Enable merge on it too and click apply. Now your shell is one monolithic mesh. However, it still contains some interior faces and we need to get rid of them. Tab into edit mode, wireframe view, face select mode, and use select all by trait again to get all the interior faces and delete them. Go back to solid view and tab out of edit mode. Your shell is still open at the top, but the opening may be too tiny to matter. If you want, you can manually seal it shut with a little more editing. I'm going to leave mine open because the hole is too small to matter. You can delete your three empties now since they're no longer needed. You can also right click on your shell and click shade smooth. As a finishing touch, add a subdivision surface modifier to smooth things out even more and you're done. I'll leave texturing and materials to you. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. If you create any shells with this method, please let me know how you go with it. Have a good one.